tip sir thank you nikhil as usual extremely efficient and uh, very punctual with your uh, with your affairs uh, i must appreciate that and my sincere thanks to dr lakshmi shikhande and the team uh, isopark for the invitation to be with all of you and uh, discuss a topic which is uh, quite close to my heart and it's a topic of interest i leave to uh, the broad uh, obg wine society so it's a great pleasure to have this uh, extremely illustrious set of panelists uh, for today's proceedings uh, nikhil what are we supposed to do are we supposed to let them introduce themselves or... yes sir you you can do that uh, but we just have to uh... close it by 4 o'clock so ideally i think everybody knows them so you could yeah. get started and have so your questions let's, directed let's to them to, to the meat of the matter yes directly let's go to the meat yeah so uh here's what uh, i uh, thought i would uh, do with uh, the panelists today um uh, it's going to be a case based learning and uh, we are going to do three or four clinical vignettes each will have eight or 10 questions and uh, i assure you nikhil that uh, will be done by 40 minutes or so i thought we'll be a little late you know getting off the blocks and so i have timed it such that uh, we should be well in time in case i go beyond that just feel free to interrupt me uh to the panelists what can i say short questions are promised and brief answers are expected time is at a premium and it's all about time because this is about pre term birth so let's get to case one straight away we have a 28 year old in her second pregnancy and uh, she has come to the clinic for a second opinion her first pregnancy 4 years ago resulted in a pre term birth at 30 weeks her daughter survived after 20 days of nicu stay and has delayed milestones she is at the moment 12 weeks uh pregnant and has a normal first trimester ultrasound and chromosomal screening she's had a dual marker which is negative her obstetrician has advised her not to have a cervical circlage so this is the background that she has come with uh let me begin with uh, dr sampath kumari how would you assess her risk of preterm labor in this pregnancy Uh, good afternoon thank you dr parichit and uh, lakshmi madam thank you for the opportunity this patient she is uh, 23 years old with a previous preterm of 30 at 30 weeks and now she is 12 weeks so we have to assess the risk factors if anything like uh, age wise she is not having any risk factor then the, any infections urinary tract infection genital tract infection and the first trimester scan and chromosomal is normal and the bmi has to be assessed and her personal habits like alcohol and work pattern and uh, smoking everything has to be uh, assessed uh, from her history and uh, previously whether she had the prom or spontaneously she went for that uh, uh, labor these are all done uh, previously whether she was assessed with any high risk whether uh, pah gdm like that any uh, factors which induced that uh, preterm has to be as uh, elicited from the patient and whether the uh, previous time the cervical length was normal during the second trimester whether it was done during the second trimester if at all needed yeah. i will go with that so uh, as dr sampat kumari has said there are a number of risk factors that need to be assessed and in the past we used to have scoring systems uh, right from the days of papernick uh we used to have scoring systems but i think today kind of boils down to the cervical assessment and my question to dr swapna yendru is what is your opinion about digital versus ultrasound assessment of the cervical status so uh, we are talking about uh, in particular with this patient dr parikshit or generally yes, yes about, only about this patient only about this patient so now she is uh, 12 weeks uh, gestational age um so and she has come for a second opinion saying that uh, the, her previous doctor advised her against so yes definitely uh, the length of the cervix has to be evaluated 
and uh, all the studies are saying that the cervical length evaluation especially the transvaginal probe is definitely more correlating with the prediction for preterm delivery rather than the digital uh, evaluation i think that's a very important message that uh, you're putting across dr swapna because you know we all talk about clinical assessment but at the end of the day we got to also be very objective when it comes to these kind of assessments and today as you rightly said it's the ultrasound transvaginal uh, which really counts when we are uh, either putting somebody in the low risk or the high risk group doctor first thing next question is for you would you offer her cervical screening with fetal fibronectin assessment is this is this the right candidate for uh, this uh, test no very good question parichi but uh, uh, fetal fibronectin has more of value after the second trimester but it is of value because she has uh, already lost her first baby so that is uh, she is a high risk patient so we have to be very uh, cautious to counsel her for screening of cervix uh, her cervix and uh, assessment of her cervix for prophylactic cervical insert uh, class so i will advise her even if her doctor has told her not to go for that because she already had her mental trauma of losing one baby previously so yes uh, absolutely cervical fetal fibronectin is more for uh, symptomatic women in the latter part of the second trimester rather than so early but she is just crossing into the uh, second trimester and there might be some role uh, for future assessments uh, that's just to uh, you know illustrate the type of cervical anatomy that one can look at uh, on transvaginal ultrasound the length as well as the shape of the cervix is what is important and the clinical role lies as dr baste very clearly pointed out more in terms of you know assessing the risk for asymptomatic women in the second trimester and a negative fetal fibronectin has a lot of value in terms of ruling out uh, preterm labor and it can reduce admissions and interventions uh, let me come to dr meena saman Uh, this lady insists on having a cervical cerclage in this pregnancy. Uh, what do you think? Would it be justified? What type of cerclage would you do? Okay, uh, here in her case, uh, definitely we have to go in for a speculum examination because that itself will tell us the condition of the cervix, whether it is too short, whether it is torn, whether we can actually get hold of it. Uh, because uh, being simple is most important if we can uh, have the cerclage going with the mcdonalds that is i think that would be the best thing uh, but if at all i think that is what i would go for if there is no not a contra there is no any other contraindication for a vaginal cerclage wonderful and uh, dr archana kumari what is your material i mean what do you usually use when you are doing a vaginal cerclage Good afternoon, everyone. I must Hello. thank you, Ashmi, ma'am, for giving the opportunity. Sir, uh, I uh, my preference of material for doing a vaginal cerclage would be non-probable suture, mostly still. Uh, Doctor Archana, your audio is uh, a little disturbed. Is there something we can do to hear you more clearly? Yeah, I was not audible. Yes, please, uh, please continue. Yeah, sir. Uh, I was just uh, telling that uh, for doing a vaginal cerclage, the material which I use normally is a uh, muscle, the non-absorbable tissue. Right. Uh, any preferences for the non-absorbable material? I mean, uh, you know, we've heard about tapes, we've heard yeah. about uh, silk, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, anything in particular which uh, you would recommend? Uh, Actually, non-absorbable suture just because of the strength and uh, it has to hold for a longer time, so definitely a non-absorbable suture is better suture. So I think uh, if I heard that correct, it's uh, it's an inert uh, vaginal uh, substance which will stay for a long time without getting disturbed. That's the yes, principle sir. of uh, selecting a material. Yes, Uh, wonderful i think that's perfectly uh, according to what uh, one would normally use uh, let me come to dr madhumita uh, madhumati now uh, when do we think about doing abdominal cerclages what 
what is their what is the place of this intervention in modern obstetrics i think uh, an abdominal circular should be indicated either um, okay uh, if she's had some kind of a cervical trauma or a cervical surgery and is not much of cervix to hold on to that is one or i mean not pertaining to this case but generally as a question if uh, she's had a circular earlier and it, it fail and it didn't really you know uh, help her for what we actually put it there for then the next time around the pregnancy then you would rather go ahead with an abdominal circular so one is either if there is not enough cervical you know tissue because mm -hmm. she's either had a trauma or coming into some kind of a cervical surgery or if there has been a past failed a mcdonald stitch so these right. would be so the two main either failure to place the circular or a previous pregnancy with a failed vaginal circular essentially these are the two and of course then you know uh, unusual circumstances where uh, uh, there is a gross distortion of the cervical anatomy yes. because of anomalies and so on and so forth yeah. so uh, these are all niche groups of uh, patients uh, who would fall into the need for an abdominal circular and uh, dr sinha uh would you usually co prescribe progesterone in this situation uh which agent uh, what's your preference yes sir uh, i used to prescribe progesterone in this type of situation because in women with single gestational pregnancy and a history of spontaneous preterm delivery the role of antenatal progesterone is very effective in preventing preterm uh, labor and for that uh, as per us fda i use hydroxy progesterone caproate 250 mg weekly im injections uh, okay. sometimes i also use vaginal progesterone right From so i think most of us will uh, use uh, progesterone uh, of course the idea of using progesterone is that we've extrapolated that from uh, evidence which comes from another study uh, it's not exactly uh, this kind of a situation but i think uh, most practitioners will use uh progesterone as an adjuvant in these uh, kind of situations uh let me uh, just complete the list of adjuvants and mention that bed rest complete bed rest is probably uh, not uh, very feasible and neither is it useful uh, post circular monitoring also not uh, useful unless there are symptoms uh, resuturing rarely ever indicated if you ever land up with that kind of a situation the pregnancy is going to probably uh, fall through anyways and tocolysis and antibiotics only in that limited perioperative period and that would uh, be where we are with uh, yeah. the circular and the discussion about the circular uh, let me come to case 2 and now we've got a 30 year old primi uh, who's transferred to your care at a tertiary center you are at a tertiary center and she has preterm contractions at 29 weeks of pregnancy uh, the pregnancy has been uneventful with a normal antenatal evaluation and she comes to the receiving room there are uh, contractions uh, two contractions every 10 minutes lasting 15 seconds moderate intensity you can feel the uterus really contracting now so let me begin uh, in the reverse order that i went uh, in the first uh, case let me begin with dr sinha uh, yes, would you usually do a sterile vaginal examination in this situation yes sir because uh, it's important to do because patient is symptomatic i would like to do a sterile examination uh, for vaginal examination with sterile uh, gloves okay uh, would you prefer a digital examination or a speculum examination first this uh, speculum examination then digital examination okay and uh, dr madhumati i am coming to a little more nuance kind of a question along the same lines there is a lot of controversy as we know that uh, you know some practitioners will do only a speculum examination and then leave it at that uh, when would you definitely do a vaginal examination and when would you definitely avoid it? So I would definitely avoid one if I either know that she's a placenta previa patient or she's come along with. I mean, though your case says she's come only with contractions, but if her papers say she's been referred to me, and if her papers say that she's placent placenta previa, I'm definitely going to avoid uh, a vaginal examination. And what I would prefer to do is put in the speculum and see that 
Just with the speculum examination, one, can I, is, uh, if I can evaluate that, is there any leaking or any kind of a fluid discharge? Uh, if I'm able to make out the length of the cervix, any dilatation, any membranes that are bulging through a dilated cervix, all this information I'm able to get from a relax. This woman is not going to be very relaxed. She's actually coming with contractions and she's a primary, so point. she's obviously anxious. But still, if I'm able to help her relax and get to see all of this with just a sterile speculum examination, then I might want to actually avoid the digital examination. And definitely, I'm not going to do one if I know that she's a placenta previa patient. So that is one definite no. Or if you see a leak, uh, you know, along with the speculum, when you put in a speculum. Yeah, I would avoid putting in, I mean, yeah, a digital examination if it can be actually avoided. And uh, when would I definitely do one is maybe, uh, let's say, like I already mentioned, if she's, you know, very tight, she's really not allowing a good speculum examination in spite of whatever I may try. And I don't really see a frank leak or bleeding happening, then maybe I would do a sterile, uh, gentle uh, digital examination to look at this, uh, I mean, to determine the um, length of the cervix, any effacement has actually started already happening with those two contractions that she's having and whether there's any dilatation. I wouldn't really typically put in my finger into the cervical loss and I wouldn't, I would do a gentle digital examination is what I'm trying to say. Absolutely, absolutely. And of course, you know, if you think that, well, she is well on the way to delivery and, you know, she's going to deliver. Yeah, if she's like more than three or four centimeters, then I would actually do a you know, proper digital examination to ensure what we are doing and, you know, to yeah. make the plan on what we do next. Absolutely. I think uh, the next question we've kind of uh, answered along with uh, this one. So I'll let that rest for a while. Let me ask Dr. Archana, uh, what are the priorities in evaluating this pregnancy overall? You know, what are the main things that we are looking at in this situation? Yes, sir. Uh, the overall priority is gestational age. And uh, uh, clinical assessment uh, about history, whether there is any discharge, doing a abdominal examination, uh, and of course, uh, as Dr. Madhu said, speculum examination and if required, abdominal examination to assess whether she is actually in a uh, second pre term labor or is it established pre term labor. Another uh, thing uh, would be to uh, know if she is done. Uh, Certain preterm labor, there are certain contraindication of uh, starting chocolysis. Like uh, we have to review the previous ultrasound report. Uh, as already uh, mentioned, that previous parameters are normal, but there then we have to rule out the contraindication of chocolysis. Like uh, if uh, uh, there is sign of infection, maternal condition like infection, uh, chorionitis or placental abduction. Then the PT condition, if there's penarchy and normalities, what relapse, all these uh, things has to be uh, looked into. Yeah, so I think uh, this is the time to take a very global view of the pregnancy, of uh, the maternal and the fetal condition, because uh, we are going to make a number of very important decisions. Uh, the chief priorities would be to evaluate the gestational age, and look at how the mother and the baby are doing overall. So, Dr. Samant, uh, how soon should an ultrasound be done? Because, you know, this is uh, something which is a bit tricky. I mean, if you are in a, a typical OBG man setup, you may or may not have somebody who's equipped to do an ultrasound. And this woman has come, which is like a semi-emergency condition. So, how quickly should an ultrasound be done and what should we, what should we be looking for? Dr. Meena Samant, if you're there, please. Okay. Uh, if, uh, yes, yes. And, yeah. yeah. Okay. This uh, this patient, she has come with contractions and she's having, uh, I understand these are painful contractions. That's why she's uh, landed to the emergency. And here, what we have to see whether she is in established labor. Also, we need to uh, see whether uh, there is some uh, problem which in which case we would not try to stop the labor whether there is some abruptio or infection has already set in or the baby is anomalous or something where we would definitely not try to interfere right now uh, 
The mm -hmm. other thing is um, uh, because she is so preterm, just barely 30, I guess it was 30 weeks or 29 weeks. So even with, uh, with this symptom, even if it is a threatened preterm, we know that the risk of preterm delivery in this, the implications are huge. So we Dr. have Norman, to... I, I wanted you to uh, kind of focus more on the value of ultrasound. Ultrasound, yes. So here uh, uh, we have, because the uh, doing an ultrasound uh, would tell us about the length of the cervix, whether she is an established, whether it is less than like now by going by the definition what the RCAG is saying, if it is less than 1.5 centimeters, we know that she's already in labor. There's a high chance that she would deliver in the next 48 hours. That's so true. that is one thing we would know by apart from the rest of the things that we, we would know about the baby and the maternal condition or any other complications. Right. So at so, this stage, because we are dis uh, discussing preterm delivery, I think this is one thing that would tell us about the outcome yeah. of the labor. Absolutely. Dr. Baste, uh, let's come to something which would be more routinely available in almost every uh, clinical setting, and that is a cardiotocogram. So, yes. uh, do you think that uh, it's valuable or useful to do an electronic <laughs> fetal monitoring for this woman? And uh, if so, how should we interpret the findings? What should we bear in mind? See, the um, NST test is very important because it will tell us about the infection or the baby's in distress or fetal heart rate. And um, her contractions are they affecting the baby, whether it is reactive or not. That will assess her um, and uh, let us know about the progress of is going to land up into uh, pre um, premature labor or not. So it is uh, important uh, if it is available. The first choice is USG, but uh, electronic fetal monitoring everybody is having. So it is uh, definitely indicated uh, to uh, take advantage of that uh, test. So I yes, I, I completely agree with you, Dr. Bas. It's a test which is much more universal. It doesn't require any great expertise to do. And uh, it should be something that uh, probably has uh, a meaningful uh, contribution to make in this situation. So just to uh, wrap this segment, uh, initial evaluation should have the correct gestational age, uh, whether uh, labor has bigger or is imminent, uh, what are the early interventions, uh, whether it's indicated or not, that will depend on the maternal and fetal condition. If there is chorionionitis, if there are medical issues, if there is acute or chronic fetal compromise, then you know your uh, approach to the whole situation is going to be quite different. And of course, what is fetal presentation? Because in case you decide that yes, labor has progressed far enough and you are going to deliver her, then you need to look at how uh, you are going to do it. Uh, ultrasound, we spoke about in addition to the general parameters. Uh, just one quick note that biophysical profile correlates with the risk of infection of the fetus. And electronic fetal monitoring, uh, loss of variability, again, it correlates with infection. Uh, if there are uh, decelerations, as Dr. Baste said, then it could point towards occult cord compression. And uh, gestational age has to be taken into account uh, when we are interpreting this. Uh, so, Can I just add something, Dr. Parikshit? Yes. Yeah, no, regarding the CTG itself, also that it's very different when we are doing... Uh, you know, NSTs for preterm babies as compared to what we we usually Absolutely. follow for the term Absolutely. babies. So, you know, the baseline FHRs mm -hmm. are usually on the higher side of normal for them. Yeah. And then their b 2 beat variability is much you know, less compared to the term babies. Their accelerations also are lesser. They're not, they're not usually more than 10, 10 beats and not more than 10 seconds. And... Um, I mean, this baby is 30 weeks, so not so bad. But if you've got a more preterm baby, then they are going to have variable deceleration. All these we need to take into consideration, so which means it will not be like our regular reactive NST I that agree, we will see in on your term. You completely, Dr. Yeah, so it would be a little more, I mean, we'll have to take it with a little bit pinch of salt. Yeah. I think this is just a reflection <laughs> of the yet to mature autonomic nervous system yes, and yes. Uh, that's what we have to acknowledge uh, when we are interpreting these. Uh, so now the cervical assessment reveals a cervix which is effacing and dilating about 2 cm. Uh, Dr. Swapna, would you usually start tocolysis for this woman? 
um, summarizing, I think at this point, uh, you need to decide whether everything is fine with the baby and the mother and you want to continue the pregnancy or is it nature which is intervening to try and uh, limit and get the pregnancy out for the sake of the mother or the fetus. So you have done your evaluation of the mother, you ruled out that there is no chorioaminitis, yes. there is no hypertension. You ruled out uh, acute compromise. And we've also seen that the fetus is absolutely fine. And um, you, so now you want, because it's 29 weeks, you do absolutely want to prolong the pregnancy. So, and you also want to give your uh, steroid to uh, stimulate the type 2 surfactants for better. We'll come to that one, uh, Dr. Swapna. So, yes. Uh, if, you, if you start the tocolysis, yes, we will start. Uh, what's your so, agent of choice? What do you normally use in clinical practice? So my agent of choice is always the always nephrodipine. Okay. Um, we use it as the first line in our hospital. We load her with 30, milli, 30 mg, uh, the loading dose as 10 mg, three separate 10 minutes apart. And then we repeat 10 mg uh, every six hour. And we watch for maternal pulse. Uh, we watch for her sugars. And we watch and see if her lungs are clear. And we watch for her BP and we maintain. We watch this and see how she is responding. Absolutely. That is my I first think... choice for nipidipine. Nipidipine being the first choice. All right. Uh, any role for unusual agents? Uh, Indomethacin, atosiban? Um, experiences, if, Dr. Swapna? Um, I have not used either of the two things. Uh, either indomethacin or atosiban. The atosiban, though it came into the market because it was a little more expensive and it needs to be given for a longer period of time once you started. And endomethacin, because it does cause cross the placenta, go into the neonate and cause, does cause premature closure of the ductus. Or in delayed, sometimes after the dose is stopped, it also prevents the ductus from closing much later in the neonate. So you've so not used it, but you they might uh, want to avoid these kind I of uh, agents like endomethacin, except when there are exceptional situations. Lots of polyhydramnios. The other uh, uh, available. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And what's your view on continuing tocolysis? I mean, this episode has subsided. Do you keep giving tocolysis or do you call it a day? So we generally continue it up to five days after the accused episode has subsided okay. and we stop it at that point. We do not give prophylactic tocolysis even when the mother overcomes this and she's discharged and sent home. Right. So uh, this is a quick overview of what uh, we've talked about. Even though beta agonists like Lanzolan and Clubutrin are very popular, I think we have to acknowledge that they have safety issues. And today, uh, we should look at nifedipine as the agent of choice. Uh, you know, Atosipan is actually the one which is uh, licensed. But unfortunately, it's very expensive. It's got a complicated dosing schedule. And then there are the other agents like magnesium sulfate, endomethacin, etc. So that's where we are with, uh, now let me come to case three. Uh, and here we've got a 26 year old primary. She's under your care antenatally and she has had an uneventful pregnancy so far. She presents to your clinic at 31 weeks with a profuse vaginal discharge. General examination findings are normal. Abdomen is relaxed, 30 week sized uterus. On speculum examination now, because we want to avoid a digital examination with that kind of a history, there's a pool of vaginal fluid and the os is closed. So, uh, Dr. Sampat Kumari, uh, let me begin with you. Do you advise tocolysis in uh, these circumstances? No, doctor. She, since she is having that uh, pool of fluid already, it is there. So, I think whatever, most probably she will deliver within 48 hours. So, I will not advise tocolysis. In okay, case, and what about corticosteroids? Yes, corticosteroids, we will do it because it is a 29. We go with a beta methasone or whatever it is, two doses with a 24 hours apart. In the meantime, she should not deliver before that uh, steroid, at least for the steroid effect, she should be. So how, how do you manage that? I mean, how do you manage to uh, keep her undelivered until the steroids have acted. So there are two views. So at least for the sake of the corticosteroid effect, you can go with the tocolysis as a previous speaker was telling about that uh, nephrodipine uh, since she is uh, 30 weeks. But uh, 
I think even uh, my, with my practical knowledge, even if the nifedipine is started, if she is going to progress, means this uh, tocolysis will not help. So I told to prevent uh, the labor, you can go with the steroids. Uh, but for the conclusion, better you go the start the uh, tocolysis nifedipine for the steroid effect for 48 hours. Then, uh, if she then is we can take her on the whether to continue better. them or not. Yes, I think that's a fair. That's a fair, uh, you know, uh, clinical working pattern, which uh, I'm sure most uh, yes. units will follow uh, to give the benefit of the doubt to the baby, because you don't want to really have a baby on your hands uh, 30 weeks without adequate steroid exposure and without adequate, uh, you know, uh, lung maturation effects, which the steroids will bring. Uh, uh, Doctor Swapna, uh, next one. Uh, what would be your antibiotic of choice and whether you would give it or not? So you decided to get me into trouble. <laughs> you decided to get me into trouble with this question. <laughs> yes. Um, um, I would give an antibiotic. Of course, when your PPRM comes, I would also send a CVP and a C-reactive protein to see if there is any latent chorioaminitis. Generally, in most cases of PPROM have a 40% incidence of latent BDS colonization in the vagina. So again, as a benefit of doubt, I would start an antibiotic. I think, I think there's a strong rationale here. I mean, uh, you know, we are uh, really looking at uh, a very good reason to give antibiotics when there is a rupture of membranes. And uh, I'm going to come to Dr. Baste, who I believe is probably the senior most practitioner and uh, you've seen how antibiotic choice has evolved. So uh, where did yes. you begin? Where are we at now? Dr. Baste, what, what See, is your choice of antibiotics? In very, this very good question. You asked me, you have taken me to the back to my uh, first uh, days of uh, practice. See, the NICE guidelines now have helped us a lot uh, to uh, channelize our um, antibiotic therapy. So previously penicillin was used, then um, with, um, erythromycin. Uh, uh, so we have to mainly um, uh, avoid group B staphylococcal GBS, what is it? because it affects the babies. So the uh, this line of treatment now is to use the broad spectrum antibiotic, which will cover uh, this um, uh, TBS and also uh, penicillin is advised by, by NICE. But what I think is that they have also told us that uh, to use strepto uh, streptomycin um, uh, along with uh, um, this. Um, uh, the, so, uh, and erythromycin is also advised, clindamycin is also very good, but clindamycin we can use local, appli and, uh, local application um, uh, is uh, more um, recommended. And um, if we start with um, uh, amoxicillin, um, uh, uh, afterwards you can shift over the patient to amoxicillin six hourly as a, um, as a what you say, maintenance therapy for at least five to ten days. Erythromycin you have to give for 10 days at least. So I think uh, very good uh, summation mm -hmm. of where we are at. And, uh, you know, the rationale is that you want latency. It's a prophylaxis and it will also be a therapy. And it does prolong pregnancy to allow the steroids to act. It does reduce major neonatal morbidity. And uh, as Dr. Baste said, today we are looking at erythromycin. Probably you want to avoid clavulinic acid because that increases the chance of necrotizing enterocolitis. And uh, then we have uh, this very important point in the decision making, which I'm going to come to Dr. Yes, Nikhil, I'm, uh, uh, I'll be through in five minutes or so. Uh, Dr. Meena Saman, yeah. what is the rationale for conservatism uh, of a PPROM at 31 weeks. Yeah, because uh, as we know, the mortality and the morbidity would be there in a younger, uh, more premature, and any uh, duration we give, increase the days, the, both the morbidity and mortality, they would all be better. The uh, neurodevelopmental delays and everything would be avoided. And uh, if we have no evidence of infection, the baby is uh, doing well, and ultrasound shows that the Leica volume is good, uh, and other parameters of infection are fine. 
I think we should uh, go on with the conservative management uh, as now even the guidelines say even up to 37 weeks. But yes, if we've crossed 34 weeks, uh, we are in a happy position. Uh, so that happy that position is going to be still 20 days away. But let me ask uh, Dr. Archana, what would be the rationale for an obstetric intervention and delivery given the same situation? You know, there are two sides of uh, the story always. And I would like you to uh, highlight what are the, uh, what's the other side? I mean, Dr. Samant is very- The, the other fit. side is of course the risk of uh, courier amenitis, the risk of ascending infection, immunity sepsis, uh, 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 and therefore increase perinatal morbidity and mortality. So uh, that's what the other side is doing. I think, uh, so this is where we need to have the balance. balance. Uh, the neurological uh, maturation, the lung maturation, which comes with time versus the damage which can happen to the same systems. You can get cytokine induced damage because of neonatal uh, and perinatal infection. So this is where uh, the decision making becomes uh, tricky and that's the challenge which obstetricians uh, face all the time. Uh, Dr. Madhumati, what factors would make you choose a cesarean section and would gestational age purely be a deciding factor in the route? So factors to make me choose a cesarean delivery in this case, one would be, uh, of course, if it's uh, an obstetric indication like a malpresentation or any of those, those are straightforward. Um, or if uh, there is a any, uh, any other maternal factor where I need to get this baby out immediately and I really can't be waiting for her to set into labor and, you know, uh, let's say she comes also with PET or any of those conditions yes. where I need yes. to get the baby out. Let me, quickly, let then me put may you have on to... the spot here. Uh, would you make any decisions based just because she is an X number of weeks I'm not going to deliver her vaginally? Okay. Uh, yeah. Not, I mean, yeah, I think in this, in this gray zone of 28 to 32 weeks, I may kind of uh, tilt towards cesarean section and not really allow her to go in for a vaginal delivery. Yeah. Yes. So, I mean, uh, I would. Maybe uh, 32 sorry, weeks in a while. I, and if she's you. already gone into labor or she's yeah. almost there, I may wait and monitor her and Absolutely. see. Absolutely. I think uh, that's a good obstetrician and a uh, good obstetric judgment speaking right there. Sorry, I didn't mean to put you uh, in a <laughs> difficult spot, but uh, you know, sometimes you get these kind of questions that you need to answer uh, because uh, you know, sometimes we look back and wonder whether doing one thing or the other would have been better at saving the baby. But most of the time, it's not the route of delivery alone which uh, yes. affects the outcomes. Uh, and Dr. Sena, this is probably the last question. What difficulties should one anticipate at a cesarean for a preterm fetus? Because at this preterm fetus, lower segment uh, is not well formed. So first difficulty, what we find is uh, formation of lower segment. So we need to give higher incision or vertical incision. And similarly, we have we find very difficulty uh, uh, in taking out the baby because of floating position of the presenting part. So these are the difficulties yes. that we find. And there's a risk for injuring the baby as well as uh, there is a risk for maternal injuries. I'll yeah. just quickly come to the use of magnesium sulfate because that's probably yeah. the last take home yeah. message which I want uh, everybody in the audience and uh, uh, to take. Uh, WHO recommends the use of magnesium sulfate in these conditions. It does reduce the risk of neurological complications. It's a standard uh, Pritchard's regime that you can use. If it's a planned delivery, then just give uh, four grams about an hour or so before the delivery is planned. And that will do a world of good for these babies. Uh, so I'm going to skip case four completely and I'll go, I'm going to end the panel here because I think we've hit four o'clock. And uh, my sincere thanks to all the panelists for their wonderful contributions. Again, thanks to Dr. Shekhande and Team Isopark for the invitation to share some thoughts about 